Good afternoon. I'm Brenda Talent, the CEO of the Show Me Institute. The Show Me Institute is pre pleased to bring you today's program on Russia, Ukraine, and the impact on the United States. For those of you who don't know us, the Show Me Institute is an independent research and education organization. We focus on Missouri fiscal and economic policy from a free market lens. We don't believe that government is the solution to every problem. Instead, we promote solutions to the problems facing our citizens from the perspective of what can we do to unleash the power and creativity of individuals. You can learn more about the Institute at showmeinstitute.org, on Facebook at Facebook backslash showmeinstitute, or on Twitter at showme. While our focus is Missouri, when there are events that have profound and extraordinary significance for Missourians, we try to provide reliable information from experts, which can help us better understand what's happening and what may happen. We did this during the pandemic, and it's important to do now with what's happening in the Ukraine. We'll be taking questions during this program. To ask a question, look at the bottom of your screen and you're gonna see a little Q&A box. Just click on that box and type in your question. Zach Lawhorn from Show Me Opportunity will be our moderator. The format of today's program is slightly different from past programs. After short remarks from each of our speakers, they're gonna have a dialogue about the situation in the Ukraine, and then we're gonna take questions. It's now my pleasure to introduce our speakers, Senator Jim Talent and James Carafano. Senator Talent has over 30 years of government and political experience, including service in both chambers of Congress. He is a nationally recognized leader on military affairs, and for his entire career, he's been the biggest defense spending hawk in Washington, with the possible exception of James Carafano. During his service in the U.S. Senate and the U.S. House, Senator Talent served on each chamber's Armed Services Committee, where he worked to advance a strong national defense and military readiness. Since leaving the Senate, he served on the National the Defense Policy Board, the U.S.-China Commission, two commissions that reviewed the Department of Defense force sizing plans, and task force on Pentagon personnel reform and the National Security Innovation Base. He's currently the chairman of the Reagan Institute's National Leadership Council. He also was for a number of years a senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation, where he worked closely with our other guest, Colonel James Carafano. Colonel Carafano is a leading expert in national security and foreign policy challenges. He's the vice president of Heritage Foundation's Catherine and Shelby Colum Davis Institute for National Security and Foreign Policy and the E.W. Richardson Fellow. Jim is an accomplished historian and teacher as well as a prolific writer and research with a PhD from Georgetown University. His most recent publication is Brutal War, a study of combat in the Southwest Pacific. He's also authored Wiki at War, Conflict in a Socially Networked World, a survey of the impact of the internet age on national security. And with that, I'll turn it over to Senator Talent. Thank you, Brenda. It's a um, great pleasure to be with Show Me as always. I've done a couple of these things, I guess, uh, over the years, and especially a pleasure for me to be with um, Jim Carafano, um, who is, I think, one of the foremost experts we could have on military affairs. I would refer anybody who is interested in the current condition of America's armed forces to check out uh, the Heritage Foundation's, Foundation's Index of Military Readiness and Strength, which is the most in-depth uh, non-Pentagon assessment of the state of our armed forces at any given time. I use it as a regular reference in my writing and speaking, and that was yet another of, of, uh, of one of Jim Carafano's great projects for the country. So <clears throat> Brenda said a, a couple minutes of remarks. I think maybe what I'll do is, um, is lay out what I think the situation is and uh, then ask Jim a question and then he can give whatever remarks he wants and we'll dialogue a bit and then get questions from you all. So I think those of us who follow these things at all were by and large, really surprised that the Russians have been so ineffective on the ground in Ukraine. And one of the questions I'd like Jim to address is whether 
they have a bad army as well as a bad plan. We know they had a bad plan. I think uh, uh, the opening days of the war and, and the plan according to which it was conducted may go down in military history as one of the biggest fiascos um, ever seen. Uh, the, uh, the Russians obviously thought they could decapitate uh, the Ukrainian government and that resistance would collapse, Zelensky would flee, uh, there would be a substantial element or fifth column within Ukraine that they could set up in charge, uh, perhaps leaving some Russian troops certainly in the east. Well, it obviously did not work out that way. And so what I think uh, Putin is trying to do now, assuming he is rational as I do, I think he's unreasonable, but I'm assuming he's rational, is to push as hard as he can in the south and the southeast uh, to cause as much destruction as he can. Um, if it works for him, perhaps cutting off the Ukrainian forces in the east from the forces around Kiev, which he's pinning down. I don't think he's actively trying to take Kiev right now, but he's pinning them down with a view towards increasing his leverage in the negotiations. In other words, the, the harder he can make the war for the Ukrainians, the better chance he has of getting a, an agreement with terms that he can at least call a success back home, which I think from his point of view would ideally include a commitment for a neutral Ukraine not joining NATO and continued Russian control or at least substantial influence in the Donbass and in the breakaway states. I'll put quotations marks around that of um, Donetsk and, uh, and Luhansk. <clears throat> and so the question really for Zelensky is, um, does he want to make an agreement like that? On the one hand, that would mean giving away uh, control over part of the country. On the other hand, he's the president of a nation that is suffering terribly with millions of refugees uh, cities being destroyed, um, possible starvation for many people and suffering. So it's a difficult call for him to make. That's, I think, um, a, a not unlikely outcome of this. So I'm going to toss this over to Jim now, and uh, he'll get whatever remarks he wants. And I hope he'll address the whole question of of what this indicates about the ability or the status, the capabilities of Russian forces. Yeah. So that's, let me see, make sure. Yeah, oh my. Okay, so that's probably a good, a good place to start as any, which is why are we where we are? This is about as close to uh, September 1914 as you could possibly be. Nobody thought we would be where we are today. Nobody thought that we would be three weeks into this war and the president of Ukraine would be addressing the US Congress or the German Bundestag. So literally every single party that is either engaged or around this conflict is, is, is operating without a plan. We are in a no plan war. The Russians, the Ukrainians, the Chinese, Americans, you name it, NATO, Poland, we are all just making this up as we go along, which is, which is for a military historian, for a military guy, really interesting, but, but kind of scary. Um, what's what, well, there's two important comments about the Russian army. And, and the first, let me, make, let me make the first one first, because it is the most important thing for people to remember. Yes, they are performing badly, but they have demonstrated they're really good at two things. Um, they are really good at killing innocent people. And they are really good at destroying their property and their livelihood and their cities. So regardless of how this conflict comes out, win, lose, or draw, people that just say, oh, well, the Russians really aren't the, the 10 foot tall we thought they were. This army is a menace to the peace and prosperity of the Atlantic community. And as long as that military is in being, and as Putin is their president, they will be a future threat to Gen. And if we don't prepare for that and prepare to counter that, this will just be the crisis before the next crisis. And, and even though that the Russians will have to kind of 
take a pause, regard, win, lose, or draw, to reconstitute their military, Putin will continue to be a menace because he has to be. His enemies must fear him. So he will be constantly looking for ways to evade sanctions, threaten, disrupt, confuse um, the West. So th this is a real enemy. People have taken nothing away from this conflict. Understand that you have seen the true color of the Russians, the Chinese that support them, and the Iranians who are trying to leverage this conflict. For them, America is the real enemy. And anything that's good for them has to be bad for America. And anything that's bad for America, they are sure is good for them. Now, as a military analyst, you know, uh, putting it, you know, it, first of all, it's very hard for me not to divorce the tragedy that's going on here. As a person that's really been in the military, this is not academic. Real people are dying here because people made stupid choices, mostly our president and the Russian president. And, and we should never divorce ourselves from that suffering. But the Russian military is struggling. Um, Jim's right. They had a bad plan. Their, their plan assumed essentially that they wouldn't have to fight anybody, that they would decapitate the, the government on day one and that the military would rapidly collapse. So if you actually look at their military operations, they were designed to occupy the Ukraine, not really fight their way into Ukraine. Um, we, the, we also have a, a, a not well-trained military. Uh, there's a reason why the Russian aircraft are firing from Russian airspace. It's because they're not even competent enough to deal with minimal um, air defense systems in the Ukraine. That's a reflection of pilot training. Their, their pilots have very limited training hours. And uh, I wouldn't take comfort with that because if you actually look at American pilot training hours today, they're almost as low as the Russians. That should worry us a lot. The, the quality of the training of the ground forces is poor. Um, and and I, think, I think this was predictable because if you actually look at the, the large Russian exercises they do every year, these Zapad and these other big exercises, they're, they're really about posturing to the West. They're not really about training the in, individual soldiers and units. Um, and, then, and then thirdly, the Russians haven't fought a big war in a long time. So not surprisingly, the logistics, right? Getting the beans and bullets to the front. That's been a real um, challenge for them. It was a challenge for us in, in Desert Storm. That was the first big war we fought in a long time. And we, and we really had ad hoc. So what's, what's, of course, I think surprising everybody is how well uh, the Ukrainians are, are fighting. And that's a combination of they're fighting on their home ground. Um, they, are, they are fighting to preserve their, their families. And it, and it is the assistance from the West. There's no question about that. If, if the Russians could cut off the influx of food and medical supplies and weapons, then eventually they would win. But it, at this point, they probably can't do that. Um, but that's not to say the Russians can lose. But at this point, it's probably almost impossible for them to win. going to say just to add to what Jim said because he referred to stupid choices so what we did really um, beginning especially in the aughts uh, we admitted more and more countries to NATO at the same time when I say we I mean the, the NATO all of the NATO countries at the same time as we were drawing down the forces that we would use to defend the countries that we admitted and therefore deter aggression. So it got so bad that as of 2013, the United States did not have a working tank in Europe. I wrote a column, I think it was in 2016, about how the German army, or what's left of it, was training with broomsticks because they didn't have machine guns in their tanks. So they were sticking broomsticks out of the turret. And we continue to do this even as um, Putin continued to aggress, first in Georgia, then in Crimea, then the constant incursions into the airspace of our Baltic allies and other allies. So he was constantly testing, and we were constantly failing to respond firmly. And then in the lead up to this, what we did was we threatened what's called deterrent by punishment, which is to impose these economic sanctions, while after we had 
had degraded our ability to deter by denial, which is what you do with actual forces. So now what we're seeing is, yes, we are punishing, uh, and Russia is going to suffer, and the Putin regime is going to suffer as it should, but the Ukrainian people are suffering, and our economy is going to take a hit as well. So long term, what do we need to do? We need to stop doing what we were doing. So stop giving concessions to Putin, particularly in return for nothing. In the last year alone, we rolled over the New START Treaty, which is a nuclear arms treaty, no, without any conditions. That's what Putin wanted. We waived the Nord Stream sanctions with no conditions. That's what Putin wanted. We gave him a summit in the United States with no conditions. That's what he wanted. So stop giving him things, build up our deterrent power and our forward posture in Russia and, and build up the armed forces in general, because we have similar issues in Indo-PACOM. And, uh, and then support the, the, uh, the countries that we, we want to protect, but we are not bound to protect like Ukraine. We were not arming them as well as we should have armed them either. That was very fitful over the last few years. So a policy of intelligent firmness, deterrence over time, is the thing that's going to constrain both Putin and the Chinese. So, Jim, you want to? Do you agree? Yeah, no, I, you know, I think you raise a most of that, but yeah, no, you I, you raise a really important point, um, and I don't want it to kind of people to kind of miss that. Um, it is interesting that. Putin may not be losing, but he's not winning. And, and he, is, he has demonstrated that he is willing to take real risks. And so despite all of that, he has not expanded this war beyond Ukraine. He hasn't tried to actually attack or prevent for things from coming into Ukraine. He, he fears NATO. I think that's I think that's the reality. He actually doesn't want to go to war with NATO. And which I, I think suggests a couple of things. And, and this is not meant to be a partisan comment. As you know, I'm not a partisan guy. I don't work at a partisan place. I don't even belong to a political party. But the reality is, is if NATO had done at the start of the war nine months ago, there wouldn't be a war now. If we had reinforced the NATO frontier, if we had hammered this guy for even thinking about, hammered an isolated entry, but thinking about attacking your country, and we had flooded Ukraine with defensive arms and medical supplies and food, this would not have happened. We self-deterred. And we had less confidence in ourselves than, and, and uh, not put too fine a point on it, because the point you made that you're right, you know, when Barack Obama left off, when Barack Obama was started in his second term, there wasn't a working American tank in, in, in Western Europe. If, if this was Hillary Clinton's second term, he would have attacked NATO because NATO would have been as so weak that, that, and Putin would have seen that because what Donald Trump did in four years, if you look at our index of US military strength, the infusion of, of, reinforcing the military in the last four years actually gave a lot more capability than we would have had if we just stayed on the trajectory that Obama had started and Clinton would have went through. So this gets to your point, which is what's really important. And I think for us as Americans, th these are the issues what we re really have to grapple with. The, the war is going to end as it ends, right? I mean, I, I wrote a piece on this for, for Fox News yesterday saying, you know, what happens after the Zelensky speech? And the answer is, you know, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We're not going to do a lot more. We're not going to do less. The Russians are going to keep doing what they're doing. I, I don't know where it ends. But, but the question we have to ask is, what do we do about our future safety and prosperity? Uh, um, the point we didn't talk about is, um, and as you have, have uh, identified so many times, the, the, the real pacing global threat is China. Um, this has a lot to do with that threat because the Chinese want exactly what the Russians want. The Chinese want a Europe that is weak and divided and vulnerable and distracted so they can expand their influence. So the Russians are their stalking horse in Europe. And, and, the, and the worst thing that, that could happen to the Chinese is to see Putin put back on his foot. So 
making Putin not a future threat is not just dealing with the Russians. It is it is a hammer blow to the Chinese. And what makes Putin a threat? And I, and you addressed a big portion of that is um, does he have the capacity to achieve his ultimate dream of dictatorial control of Central Europe, NATO dissolved, the United States be alone and isolated? And the answer is no, as long as we have the military capacity from conventional and strategic arms to deter him. So peace through strength, the, the path that we were on for four years under Trump, we have to do that. Um, the second part is, is, is uh, energy independence. Right. Right? The other weapon that Putin has is blackmail, sell, make uh, an American energy independence, a Europe that has a sensible energy policy that provides for reliable, um, uh, dependable, uh, affordable, abundant energy, that if we do those two things, those are the only real weapons Putin has to threaten with us. We have taken the Russia, the Russia threat essentially off the table. So we have to do that. And, you know, the, and this is a point nobody's really talked about, but I think it's so important. Win, lose, or draw, the Russian military is going to be prostrate uh, after this conflict. It is going to take him a year or two to rebuild. Um, we should not waste that time. That is the time for us to re-strengthen NATO. That is the time to deal with these vulnerable nations. That is the time to establish energy independence. God has given us a, a second, well, God in the, in the face of the Ukrainian people have given the West a second chance to, to reposition itself so it's not facing a larger and more dramatic war. And we have to take advantage of that. You know, what worries me, and, and I, you know, Jim maybe has some thoughts on this, is, you know, I listened to the president's State of the Union address, and, it, and it's very clear what we need to do. We need peace through strength. We need energy independence. And most importantly, we need to unleash the American economy underneath that to pay for that. I didn't hear anything in the president's address that talked about peace through strength. I didn't hear anything that talked about making America energy independent and all of the economic things I heard the president outline would actually make our economy worse. And so when I look at the three fundamental things that we have and, and, the, and the breathing space that we might have to do it in the next year or two, I, I didn't hear from our president the willingness or the leadership or the commitment to do any of those. Yeah. Well, Jim mentioned the Chinese and Brenda, I know you want to go to questions. So... I'll just say very briefly, they're going to, they are studying this very carefully. They're watching what we do. Um, I was on the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission. We put out a report last year. We had a chapter on Taiwan and assessed that the Chinese are at or near. And when I say if they're, if they're not at it, they're within a couple of years of an initial invasion capability of Taiwan which is a core interest, as they say. Uh, they want to reunify. And I do not believe Xi Jinping, who is now well into his 70s, is going to wait another 10 years to do that. So the way to deter them, the way to protect um, ourselves, our own security, and the security of our allies, formal and informal, is to be prepared to defend it's, uh, this goes back to, you know, the Cold War. I think it was, was it John Foster Dulles who said, uh, if, we, if we're prepared to defend Berlin, we won't have to. Uh, and this is the thing that is so frustrating over the years, because if, if the United States and its allies are in a position to defeat an aggressor, uh, an aggressor like this, you have substantially reduced the risk that they'll do it. I mean, you, you can never reduce that risk to zero, but you can try, and it is so much less expensive to do it that way up front than it is to deal with it after the aggression. And it's largely a question of sustaining the military at, at appropriate levels. So Jim is right. I mean, President Trump was the best president that we've had on that. I mean, he, he, he ended the defense sequester and raised the defense budget $100 billion over two years. But his last, I think, two budgets, Jim, were basically flatline budgets vis-a-vis -vis inflation. And Congress just increased the Biden submission for defense to about 5%, but that's not even going to keep up with inflation as high as inflation is. 
So we're either going to pay up front to prevent war, to protect people, uh, so that this kind of suffering doesn't occur, or we're going to pay a whole lot more down the line uh, when these kind of wars occur. And well, then, I, 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 go ahead. No, I just want to add real quickly, and that, and that's not a free lunch. I mean, there are plenty of Republicans that want to spend more on defense, and and maybe they have Congress and, and control of Congress to push for that. But that has to be prepared with a responsible economic policy. You no, got to get, have to get inflation under control. You have to get deficit spending under control and you have to unleash the American economy and, you know, and, 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 you know, repeal the regulations, you know, stop the things that are constraining Americans from doing business in the world. If we can't do those things, we're, we're not going to get there from here. Right. Brenda, I think you wanted us to do 20, 25 minutes. Uh, you know, Jim and I will go on the rest of the hour. Um, <laughs> Thank you very many much. Times in the past. Or Zach, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you want to take questions? Yes. Um, so I want to remind everyone watching to please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions. So yesterday, when President Zelensky addressed Congress, he asked, close the skies over Ukraine. Colonel Carafano, what is your thought on a no-fly zone, and would Putin see that as an act of war? Well, you know, first of all, I would say, you know, Militarily, it's not the most important thing. Like I said, most of the Russian aircraft are op operating outside of Ukrainian airspace. So closing the airspace actually doesn't really do that much. Much of this war is being done, the air war is being done by, not through what's called air supremacy, where somebody controls the skies. It's being done by drones, and a no-fly zone really wouldn't um, affect that. It would be very, very difficult to do. Uh, the, the honest answer is you could only do it if the United States supported it. And, and for the United States to, to enforce a no-fly zone, it would have to assume that that would be challenged, which means that the United States would be a belligerent to the conflict, um, and, and you, would, you could possibly see a war between, you know, I think that's just the reality of it. Um, I, I don't think anybody, look, it's not going to happen because NATO is not going to agree to it. Um, the other thing is, is, look, the responsible answer is give the Ukrainians more planes. Um, the fact that we didn't do that, I think, just demonstrates the weakness of our national leadership. We got bogged down in saying, oh, we can't give the, the Ukrainians planes because the Russians will see that as escalatory. Well, that's nonsense. I mean, the Russians are invading a country and killing everybody, and you're worried about annoying them. So I, 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 I don't think that, I think that's a much more responsible um, answer. Uh, and, and maybe now, but that, 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 that the, it's clear the Ukrainians are hanging on, maybe people will go to that responsible option and figure out how we, we can get them more combat aircraft. I will make a comment. And I'm interested in hearing Jim's thoughts on this. What happens if Russians and a NATO country actually start shooting at each other? Right. Well, I was, Which is I, never, I, never assume that that won't happen, right? Never assume that a bomb won't stray over the line or that Putin won't get so desperate that he drops a couple of bombs somewhere to say, okay, NATO, back off. My guess is uh, if he did that uh, and the country in, 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 uh, saw that as a, a, uh, a deliberate act, that there would be a request for, for Article 5. So Article 5 is the collective agreement of NATO to, to defend all the countries in NATO. And having said that, I, I think the NATO, the, the, the NATO approach would be proportionality. So in other words, yeah. if, if the Russians attacked an air base, or, you know, if the Russians dropped a bomb, we would take out the launchers that sent that bomb. I don't think it would necessarily spiral into World War III. But, you know, the reason why nuclear powers have never openly made war with each other is because they've always feared that, yeah, you know, there's a lot of steps on the ladder of escalation, but they've never been really super confident about what happens when you start going up that ladder. And so they've always been kind of smart enough to not do that. So, for example, if you think of the Korean War, there were like a million, I don't know the exact number, there were, you know, a million Chinese fighting in, in North Korea against the Americans and the Chinese government said, well, they're all volunteers. And, and there were actually Russian pilots flying MiGs against American planes. We just pretended like we didn't know that because Russia and China and the United States weren't willing to say they're war with each other and risk a nuclear confrontation. Yeah, you want, you want strength and firmness to deter the conflict. When the conflict occurs... 
and there are nuclear powers involved, you have to be very careful that you don't get into an escalatory ladder, okay? So our policy, at least on the surface, was we're going to arm the Ukrainians, and the Russians shouldn't object to that. They, after all, armed the North Vietnamese in a war that we fought there a number of years ago. That's not escalatory. That is a proportionate response. But were we to impose a no-fly zone, we would be inviting conflict directly between American and Russian forces that would be viewed as escalatory. And people need to focus on this. And my old friend, and he really is an old friend, I've known him for 30 years, uh, Lindsey Graham. This is something I disagree with Lindsey about. Putin doesn't have very many domains he can escalate in. He can't do anything economically to us. He's lost the information war. The Ukrainians have kicked his butt, and we should all be grateful for that. There is one area he can escalate, and that's in hard power. Uh, they have what, Jim? Is it a thousand tactical or low yield nuclear weapons? Uh, and it's much. It's a much bigger number than that. I Maybe mean, two, then, a, huh? I no, always it's, forget. It's a much bigger number than that. I mean, You're kidding. literally, we are. A, at, at the, for tactical nuclear weapons, NATO is a pygmy, and uh, uh, Russia is uh, Gulliver when he's right. ten feet tall. So when you do, not, there's already a non-zero risk that he would use them, and we do not want to go there. That certainly would not be good for the Ukrainians. So no, no, no fly zone, but absolutely arm them, including the MiGs. Jim, I you know I consider giving them F-16s. I, I, those are pretty easy to learn. I mean, yeah. relatively speaking to fly, yeah. but anyway, I, yeah. I, I don't know how important that is to them, but uh, no, no fly zone, but no, no fly zone, but yes, arm them. All right, next question. Would America or the West allow Ukraine to do a deal with Russia that would concede territory to Russia? You know, Jim, well, I'm happy I, to, you, you want to go ahead? Go ahead. Well, I was going to say, I mean, I, the one thing, one thing I do not want to see us do is pressure the Ukrainians to agree to something they don't want to agree to. I think they've earned the right to make the kind of deal they want to make. So I hope we do not pressure them to do that. But I do think that Zelensky has to be considering that as an option. I mean, this is a call he has to make. How, how, how much does he want his country to suffer? What are the possibilities I mean, none of us are certain about this, that he can actually counterattack and improve the situation on the ground and get better terms. Jim, you, I know you were over in Eastern Europe pretty recently. You may know a lot more about this. Yeah, than I well, did. no, I think that this is really is the, the, the great question. Um, but the, you know what's important about this is Z the, Zelensky has options. And this has been actually one of the big problems with Biden's dealing with adversaries from the beginning, which is we want to do nothing and then we'll then we'll react when the enemy does something. And, you know, in the military for 25 years, the one thing I learned is the worst possible situation is to be sitting there waiting for the enemy to decide what to do and having the time and place of their choosing on how to do. You want the enemy to be reacting to you, not the other way around. And so in defending his country, Zelensky's actually created some space for himself. The, the, the thing I would look, dude, you're already in a horrible, terrible, awful war. Nothing is going to change that. What you need, if you survive, what you need to think about now is how do I prevent the next war against Ukraine? Mm -hmm. And if I were advising Zelensky, I would say you have to fight until you have an advantage. And, and the Russians want something. Because if you're, if you're negotiating from a position of disadvantage with the Russians, you will always get your lunch eaten. You always want to negotiate from the Russians from a position of strength. So my advice is you have to fight until the Russians are desperate for peace. You know, the Russians have only voluntarily ever given ground back they've conquered in modern history once. That was in 1955. In 1955, they voluntarily withdrew from the occupation of Austria. That's the only time since the Soviet Union has been created that they ever voluntarily really gave up a piece of ground. So the notion of, you know, depending on Russian goodwill to give you a deal, that's just nonsense. So let's say the Russians can fight and hold on or even potentially maybe make some advantage back and the Russians want a deal. 
I, I, I completely agree with you. The, the Ukrainians have earned the right to determine their own future and, and far be it from us to advise them or dictate to them what they should do. And, and I, I actually, um, when you hear these stories about the United States or the Israelis telling them just cut a deal and accept neutrality, um, I think that's horrific. I, I'll be honest, my personal opinion, I don't think neutrality does anything for the Ukrainians. It's just the war before the next war. Because by in declaring you neutrality you, or, and limits to your armed forces or limits to, you just basically declare that you're a sitting duck for the next time the Russians want to come back and eat you. you I mentioned the Austrians. They, they declared neutrality. If you ever saw the Soviet war plans, the actual real war plans, which we saw after the Cold War came down, there was just a big freaking arrow that went right through the middle of Austria. Mm -hmm. they, they had no intention whatsoever of honoring Austrian neutrality. Um, I actually would argue the better option for the Ukrainians, if, if they survive and there's an, is like, dude, I would turn around and join NATO tomorrow and, and I would let them in NATO and EU because the reality is, is there's nothing the Russians can do about that for two years. Once you're in, you're literally behind the, you're behind the blue line and you're safe forever. And then you've got two years to re rehabilitate, rebuild the country and prepare. So when, so even if the Russians rebuild their military, you're a much harder thing to eat. And you can do that without relinquishing any of your, um, any of your right or any of your claim on captured territory. If you think back, you know, West Germany, even though East Germany was occupied, West Germany joined NATO and they never relinquished the idea that Germany was one country. Uh, and I don't think the Ukrainians would have to do that either. Um, but that's a future that's that's not here yet. Um, you know, there's still a lot of fighting and dying, sadly, I think, left before we get to that point, because it seems Alex, to me the Russians are talking, but they're 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 still plenty happy to fight and kill. Senator Talent, you mentioned the information war. What do we know about what the Russian people um, are being told? What do we what do we think the information flow into the Russian general public is like at this point? Well, Putin has tightened down um, control over information as much as uh, he possibly can. He shut down um, the independent, I mean, the ones who were, at, uh, the, the media outlets that were at all independent, strict censorship. They can't even refer to this as a war. Um, he's, you know, arrested or interned anybody who dissents, and we can expect more of this. Um, if he can get out of the war on terms that he can trumpet as a victory, I think, as I said, I think that's what he's trying to do now. Then you can expect this repression to continue at a very high level because I'm sure he's concerned about regime stability uh, and he'll want to tighten it down at least in the short term. Now, having said that, um, he, he doesn't have the kind of control the Chinese do. He doesn't have a great firewall. Uh, I'm sure some of this is getting through, plus which, you know, the soldiers come back and they have a story to tell. But um, it's going to be very, very bad for the Russian people. I want to add something else, too. I don't know what Jim thinks about this. Um, I really do not like um, the kind of war fever here that is uh, taking it out on ordinary Russians or non-political Russians or Russian artists here. Now, if they're connected with the regime or active supporters of the regime, fine. Those are the people we ought to be aiming at. You know, but boycotting um, a Russian restaurant in New York uh, is, is, first of all, it's not right. But second, you, we do not want to make or an enemy of the, of the Russian people. And we don't want to give Putin any basis for saying that we're doing so. We simply have to have firm, long-term policies of strength rather than, rather than doing nothing, appeasing him for years, and then <clears throat> ping-ponging to this kind of histrionic reaction. So we, have, we, we are fully capable of defending ourselves, our interests, and our allies in Eastern Europe. We just have to do it. And uh, again, I mean... You know, we won the Cold War. One of the big reasons we won the Cold War was that Ronald Reagan rebuilt the armed forces. And the Soviets basically threw in the towel between that and the 
and the Poles and the Pope, I mean, that was more than they could take. So, um, yeah, so uh, he's going to he's going to repress the people and try and keep inf information away from them. Um, and he, he will have a great deal of success in doing that. Uh, Colonel Carafano, is life as Putin knew it, no matter the outcome of this, as a head of state, is, is that over at this point? Whether the outcome is diplomatic or otherwise, do you see any path to where this goes back to a Russia relations with the West or even the rest of the global community as it was three weeks ago? Well, that, that's the real question. This is one of those potentially massive turning points in history. Like I said, what we have seen in the last few weeks is, is really you know something Jim and I have talked about for years and people have disputed with us, but these are the true colors of, of these countries. Russia, Putin's plan, regardless of win, lose, or draw, his, his vision for the future remains untrained as long as he is in power. He, he wants to reabsorb all the post-Soviet states. He wants dictatorial control over Central Europe. He wants NATO to dissolve. He wants the United States to be isolated and alone in the world. China wants to have a hard sphere of influence that extends um, in, in, in globally from, from the Arctic to the Antarctic into Latin America and Africa to have a dominant influence in Europe and, and for the United States to be alone and isolated. Iran looks to both Russia and China to open up space for them to essentially de declare an empire in the Middle East. You know, all these things in, under the best case scenario would mean America alone and isolated in the world. Um, not to mention that, you know, all of our friends and allies say, well, you know, we think differently on China or, you know, we have Russia or whatever. But the reality is, is none of them. There is not one country in the world that wants to be a suburb of Iran or Moscow or Beijing. And the question is, what do we do now? Because in order to do the kinds of things, to unleash our economy, to defend ourselves, to have energy independence, to find ways to make money without you know, dealing with China, uh, to live without Russian oil, to, to have the willingness to, to step up against the Iranians and maybe for Israelis and Arabs to partner together. Um, all these require really, really hard choices. Um, because if they were easy choices, we would have made them, uh, but we didn't. And so the question is, is what do we do? Do we go back to sleepwalking through history and say, well, it wasn't World War III. You know, there were no nuclear mushroom clouds. Okay, so a bunch of people in Iran died. You know, a couple of months ago, you know, 40, 40 million Afghans lost their freedom. You know, and we're still here. We're still going to Walmart. Or, or do we say, because if, if, if you actually add together the threat of China, Russia, and Iran, and with Russia's military capability, which Jim pointed out is not just an army, but, but really they are the preeminent nuclear power in the world today. Um, they far outweigh the United States when you add in their tactical nuclear weapons. But then the, the damage that the Iranians can do because of the strategic area that they're in and the, the map and China, which is either the largest or second largest economy in the world, Together, if you add those three of those things together, that is a global threat that actually is on par to what the Soviet Union was during the Cold War and, and certainly at, on par with what the Germany and Italy and Japan represented during World War II. We are faced with the generational challenge of a lifetime. And because of 44 million brave and fearless Ukrainians who are fighting on because they're not smart enough to know they should just roll over. We've got a breathing space here to, to do something about shaping our future. And the, the, the uncomforting answer for your question is, I, I don't know. I, I heard a president give a State of the Union address and talk not just to the American people, but to the entire world and say, I'm not going to do the. I'm not going to make those hard choices. You've mentioned energy a couple of times. Barrel uh, oil is over a hundred dollars a barrel again this morning. Aside from high gas prices here in America, what are some of the other ripple effects that we could see if this conflict carries on for months, years? 
Well, we're to some degree in uncharted territory because we don't know what the impact's going to be, for example, of cutting countries off from the SWIFT payment system. Uh, we're, we're using one of the tools of power that we have is the fact that the dollar is the reserve currency and the financial system of the world, uh, uh, certainly all uh, you know, above the board activities, has to go through uh, the American financial system. So this is a really powerful tool and it's a way that we can use to punish countries. And, and this is an area in the last 20 years in particular where we have gotten a lot better. Uh, the sanctions are much more effective than they were than when I when I went into the Congress in the 1990s, largely because we can focus on the financial system. But we don't know what the impact's going to be on us on the stability of our system going forward because we're really in, in very much in uncharted territory, and we can't use that kind of a tool against the Chinese. We are too intertwined with their economy. Their economy is too big. Russia's GDP is about $1.7 trillion. So it's, it's about a 12th the size of our economy. If you add in Europe, it's about a 20th the size of the American and the European economy. The Chinese are not in that position. And so while we can use those tools, uh, we can supplement other tools of deterrence, we really have to be stronger and in a position where, um, where the aggressors fear that they cannot accomplish their goals within an acceptable margin of risk if they use military power. And I just want to say something about Jim is right. The threat is very severe. But one of the things that's frustrating to me is the United States has enormous reservoirs of strength just here at home, not to mention the strength of our allies if we'll just use them with a purposeful, confident policy over time. And um, a lot of people in this not you, Zach, but a lot of people watching this are old enough to remember when we did that in the 1980s and the Soviets collapsed. So I, these countries are not 10 feet tall. The Chinese have enormous problems of their own. But if we, if we do not prepare to defend our interests, then our interests are going to get attacked. And that's one of the lessons here. And on well, that, I just, Colonel Carafano, well, I just I want to add a couple of things. Uh, so among other areas, so for example, um, like 40% of the world's global food production is dependent on fertilizers. Which is one of the most, uh, one of the components of making fertilizers is natural gas. So the competition for natural gas for fuel is, is going to dramatically impact the cost and the availability of fertilizers. So this, that's going to have rippling impacts all over the globe. Um, petrochemicals are, are used in all kinds of industrial manufacturing processes. So the, the gallon of oil that you're competing for that goes into your gas tank is the same oil that's competing for for all other kinds of industrial processes. So that's going to ripple across the economy. And so, and this is all happening in a time that we already have high inflation. So um, th this goes back to the point about hard choices. And you know, and you know, Jim's point is so absolutely powerful. We have potentially the world's most dynamic um, and aggressive economy. And we have the, per it's like we have the perfect, you know, it's like the guy, would, you know, I forget in like the Infinity Wars who had the, the, the fist with the five little stones there that he could, you know, destroy universe. We have the world's most powerful instrument in the United States. We have the most powerful economy in the world. And all we have to do is put that fist on and let it run wild. Not, not overly direct it, you know, not tell it what to do, stage manage it, but we could be the world's largest energy producer um, we can be the world's most dominant manufacturing power. We can work with other countries and create economies which are resilient against Russia and China. We, we just have to. We just have to let. We just have to let our people do that. Um, and that's good. That's the, if we don't do that, uh, we're not going to win by trying to imitate what the Chinese and the Russians are doing. Carol Carafano, you yes, recently exactly. wrote, uh, Beijing hopes that the Ukrainian crisis will stretch the Americans like a rubber band, making the U.S. unable to pay attention to Europe and Asia. Are we prepared to protect Taiwan if this crisis carries on and if NATO and the West has to get more involved? Well, you know, I, I, you know, Jim mentioned Taiwan before. You know, people, it's really people understand the importance of Taiwan. Everybody thinks, well, we want Taiwan. It's a democracy. We should stand for democracy. You know, they make all these silicon chips that we need for everything. So we need the chip thing. 
But the one thing people don't understand is, is Taiwan is a crucial island in what's called the first island chain. And so if you think of this island chain as kind of running up and down the coast of Asia, whoever controls that island chain, they basically control everything. That a whole line of communication where, where nuclear subs can go, where shipping can go, every, the, where the flows of energy can go. If China controls Taiwan, then you, you just write off South Korea and Japan because they're basically cut off. So there's a strategic imperative of why it's vital for the United States to ensure Taiwan can defend itself. So I, I'm in the camp that says, dude, we're going to have to fight for Taiwan because the, the, yeah, the idea yeah. of of losing Taiwan to me is as repugnant as the idea of the Russians taking over Great Britain. So um, Jim graciously mentioned the index of U.S. military strength, which looks at that says, you know, the United States has to have the capacity simultaneously to, to operate in the United States, I'm sorry, in, in Europe, in the Middle East, and in the Indo-Pacific. And I, I think the, the answer is we don't have that. And, and the real problem is, and, and Jim's maybe been the greatest champion, but we cannot get by with two out of three. You know, it, this is like the guy that goes to the doctor and says, you have, a, you, have a, um, you have a brain tumor, cancer, and a bad heart. Which, which one of those would you like me to treat? And well, you're like, doc, well, what will happen if, if I only treat one? Well, you'll die from the other two. We militarily have to be able to deter Japan, I'm sorry, China, <laughs> Russia, and Iran simultaneously. And, 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 and including the, the capacity we have in our friends and allies, the, the margin of safety is too thin. And we've got to fix that. And if we don't, we will, somebody, if, Ukraine will just be the crisis before the next crisis because China or Russia or Iran, somebody will try something else because the margin of safety is just too thin. Yeah, if we have it. We're, we're outnumbered in ships by the Chinese five to one west of Hawaii. They have the most powerful missile-centric military anybody's ever devised, and the, the range of their missiles outranges our, the fighter aircraft on our aircraft carriers. And most of the striking power, the surface striking power of the United States Navy is in the aircraft carrier task forces. So we have a problem. If the balloon goes up over Taiwan and the surface Navy tries to get close to prevent an invasion, uh, our ships are going to be targets. And I, you know, I don't go into that at, at great depth, and a lot of this stuff gets into classified. Now, we still have advantages, for example, in the undersea domain, uh, because our, our attack submarines are probably the deadliest platforms in the world. But the point is, we need to get ready. And to talk in concrete terms, um, most people who look at this, the experts like Jim, will tell you that we need a five-year defense plan where we're increasing the defense budget by about 3 to 5% a year in real terms. That's above the rate of inflation, okay, which unfortunately is now much higher than it used to be. This is fully affordable. Nobody can claim it isn't. We've spent $4 trillion in the last two years, and not a dime of it went to the Department of Defense and all those emergency measures that were that was being spent. So this can be done. And the object here, again, is to protect our security, the, the integrity of our allies, and do it without war. And you, the way you do that is by being strong. Senator Talent, we had months and months and months of intelligence and the troop buildup on the border of Ukraine. Do you think if China were to invade Taiwan, would it be a similar intelligence situation? Do you think that we would have uh, as long a runway and a warning, as, or do you think it would be a different tactical invasion altogether? I think we'll have some intelligence. I'd love Jim's insights on this. Uh, yeah, I think we, we should have some intelligence because they're going to have to build up uh, some forces. I think the real tell will be that they, they it's, it's likely if, if Beijing decides to do this, that they will precipitate some kind of a conflict or a controversy where they are claiming um, that Taiwan is preparing to be independent or ta Taiwan is outraged or crossed some red line uh, and where they can, they can do a run up to a conflict. But I suspect, knowing the Chinese rulers as I do, that they'll leave themselves an off ramp 
short of an invasion, and they'll look at very carefully at what we do. So, no, I don't think this is going to happen overnight. You know, this is not going to be like Pearl Harbor, or some real surprise attack. I think we'll have some run up, but I, they're not going to do, I doubt they'll do what, what Putin did, which is like mass everything and make it absolutely certain that, that, that they're moving as of a particular time. Jim, what do you think? Well, well, first of all, I'd say you know, Taiwan's actually a harder military target than the Ukraine. All the oh, Russians yeah. had to do to get to Ukraine was drive across the border. Um, the, the Chinese would have to cross a big ocean. Uh, and and, and the, the addition of the ocean is not just distance. It's a, it's a, a magnitude greater logistical challenge. Um, so that's something they have to think about. Uh, I think hopefully the Taiwanese have learned a lesson from this conflict. Uh, we can have long discussions about Taiwanese defense plans, but what the Ukrainians have showed is um, defeat by denial is a real option. In other words, not losing may be the best way to win, because if you can demonstrate to the Chinese that you will not conquer us for weeks or months and give time for, and that, would, that gives time for the international community to kind of raise their ire against you, um, that's that's a pretty powerful deterrent as well. So what I'm, what I'm looking for is, I don't want to ever get to the point where the Chinese think that this is an option. And there's, uh, there's two things that I think that affect that. One is, uh, as Jim pointed out, we've got to really be serious about building up our, our military capability, which also means we need to get serious about getting our own physical house in order. The other is, is um, Taiwan needs to rethink, needs to think about uh, um, the capacity to defend Taiwan and, uh, and, and the international community needs to increase its connectivity with Taiwan because what we've seen here is look how quickly the international community came behind the Ukrainians and that really didn't make all the difference. The fact that the supplies are flowing, the refugee is floating, um, all, all our weakness and failure and, and you, know, in the, you know, in the end we came because Ukraine is sitting there right next to the European Union and NATO. Taiwan is a long way away from a lot of people. But the more people engage with Taiwan, have links with Taiwan, support Taiwan, and the more the, the, that's more the Chinese have to worry about the next time that this happens, the international community won't rally behind them. Because if you think about Chinese, their policy over the last 20, 30 years has been to isolate Taiwan economically, diplomatically, and politically. And... That, that's a precursor for an invasion. We have to fight back on that. So this is, this is an, uh, an all of the above. It's military, it's, but it's also economic and political and diplomatic and trade. All right, we only have a couple minutes left, so this will be the last question. Thank you all uh, who submitted them. So we've all seen the horrific pictures coming out of Ukraine, the bombing of the shelter in Mariupol yesterday. Short of a diplomatic resolution to this, uh, Senator Talent, we'll start with you. What should America's red line be? Is it the use of chemical weapons? Is it a, you know, a tactical nuclear weapon? Like, or do we not have a red line? Yeah, I think the red line is if if he um, if Putin attacks uh, a treaty ally of the United States um, now which obviously is one of the NATO countries then, and I fully agree with Jim, you have to respond. We should have a menu of options right now and the response should be proportionate, not escalatory. In other words, you strike back, you respond horizontally, not with a vertical kind of, ex, uh, of, of escalation. Um, I don't, it's, it would be a very, very tough call but I don't think, short of a use of a tactical nuclear weapon, uh, I, d I don't think, even if he gets more brutal, uh, that we can change the fundamental strategic direction of the policy and get involved. But that would be, that's a presidential call. I just think the risk um, of that that will be seen as escalation uh, is too great. I mean, and both for the Ukrainian people and for our people, we, we do not want this to spiral upward. Yeah. Look, I'll just say we, we'd all be a lot safer and better off if, if Jim Talent was Secretary of Defense, the President of the United States. Um, 
the, the other thing is, look, I want to, before we leave, I do want to say you guys are so lucky to have the Show Me Institute. This is one of the nation's pioneering and premier state-based think tanks. And if, I don't know if anybody's noticed, the only good things happening in America today are happening at the state level. And that's because the energy and the dynamism and the innovation uh, uh, and of uh, places like the Show Me Institute. So uh, you are so lucky to have that institution working for you. And the last thing I want to say is, you know, we can all make a difference here. Uh, I have a group of like 60 folks that I work with. They've done some incredible things. They, these people have shipped millions of dollars worth of, of non-lethal aid to the Ukrainians and help refugees and everything else. We can all, all do this. I put two in the chat, uh, fantastic organizations, one called Spirit of America, which is actually helping get non-lethal assistance to Ukrainian military and National Guard. Um, Samaritan's Purse is, is one of the most dependable and reliable um, agencies in the world, helping out with refugees in Ukraine. Um, those are both groups I work with during the Afghan crisis who did remarkable work. Um, I, you, know, you should always do due diligence and just don't throw money at somebody to make sure you're working with real people. But some of the best work that's being done out there today has nothing to do with governments. It's NGOs and individual people who are helping out the Ukrainians unconstrained by what governments think. And, and they're some of the reason that the Ukrainians are still in this fight. And so um, don't sit back. I mean, you can help. There, I talked to a guy in Florida who's a sheriff who's collecting up flak vests from police departments that are excess and they're finding somebody to put it on a plane and take them to Ukraine. So we, we can all be part of this fight. We don't have to sit back and just watch it on TV. And um, thank you guys. I want to thank the talent of talents for inviting me today. It's been a real honor to be with you guys. Thank you both, Brenda. Turn it over to you. Uh, Jim, thank you for your kind words regarding our work. I want to thank both of you for a very informative program and, and really for giving us a lot to think about. Thank you, Jim, for sharing those resources that we can contribute to in order to help the people who are suffering over in Ukraine. And I want to thank everyone for joining us this afternoon. Um, Look, look at our website for our next event and um, everyone keep a good thought and be safe. Thanks very much.